to listen to that or, or look at that uh, video. Be, believe it would be a blessing to you. He made mention of someone being saved uh, as a result of the baptism. You know, when I was uh, growing up, we used to have all of our baptisms uh, down at the river. And uh, I don't know why I just thought about this, but numerous times there would be snakes laying on the rocks, <laughs> sunbathing, and we would be in the river baptizing. But listen, it used to be a common thing for people to get saved at a baptizing. Folks who were lost would come out to see their family member or their loved one get baptized, and we would always have preaching and singing, just like we would any other time. And I have seen numerous people get saved on a riverbank at a water bath. And so, what a blessing. I'm glad the gospel still works, aren't you? All right, Bible terminology, lesson 10. We are on word 101. Turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. The first word that we will look at tonight is the word flagon, F L A G O N. Uh, the word flagon is found five times in five verses in our King James Bible. Uh, we'll look at this, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to pray together before we read. We'll get right into the lesson. Paul, thank you for this opportunity. Would you please help us this evening to be a blessing and a help to God's people. And pray you give us liberty, Lord, and understanding and wisdom. Help us to say the things that are needful and necessary. And help us, Lord, to refrain from saying anything that would be grievous to the Spirit of the Lord. Father, we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, word number 101, flagon. We get an idea of what a flagon is by reading its first mention in Scripture here in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 19. The Bible says, And he dwelt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh, and a flagon of wine, so all the people departed, every one, to his own house. Now, we can see from the first mention of this word flagon in the Bible that a flagon is some sort of vessel for holding liquids. Now, come to Isaiah chapter 22. We'll get some additional information about a flagon in Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22 and verse number 24. Isaiah 22, verse 24. We'll get some Bible calisthenics in this afternoon as well. Isaiah 22, verse 24. The Bible says, And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. And so we learn from this passage of Scripture that a flagon is a smaller vessel in other words, it's not a big barrel of liquid. Uh, a flagon is actually a vessel with a narrow mouth, like a pitcher or a vase-shaped glass, and it is used for holding liquids. In fact, it is, it is uh, you can pour liquid or drink liquid right out of the flagon. There's three other references, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, Song of Solomon chapter 2, and Hosea chapter 3. Now come to Acts chapter 28, Acts chapter 28, we're moving quickly, we're going to look at word number 102, and that is flux, F-L-U-X, Acts chapter 28 in your Bible, the word flux is only found one time in the scripture, we know right away before we even read the verse, it's talking about a bloody flux, we know about Acts chapter 28. The only reference is here in Acts 28 and verse number 8. The Bible says, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So the word flux means the act of flowing. And so it is a motion or passing of a fluid. And so this fellow here, Publius's uh, dad, here in Acts chapter 28 and verse number 8, he, his fluid flowing from his body was mingled with blood. Now, this is a horrible condition. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what all that con, uh, consists of, but if you're leaking blood, that's not a good thing. Uh, but whatever that horrible disease was, it was not too hard for the Lord to take care of because the Lord allowed uh, Paul uh, 
prayed for him, and the Lord healed him. What a blessing. Now, come back to Deuteronomy, all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Jeremiah chapter 7. We'll look at both of these places. They're close together. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Jeremiah chapter 7. And we'll look at the word number 103. And the word is fray, F-R-A-Y, fray. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 26. We'll get some good stuff here in just a moment. Deuteronomy 28, verse 26. The word fray is found three times in three verses in our King James Bible. We're going to look at one of them here. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 26. The Bible says, And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beast of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. So what we're seeing here in Deuteronomy chapter 28 at the end of the chapter, in fact, the first part of chapter 28 of the book of Deuteronomy has to do with the blessings for obedience, and the latter part of the chapter has to do with the curses for disobedience. And so what we're seeing here at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're seeing the curses of, upon God's people for their disobedience. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter number 7, and we're going to look at verse number 33. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 33. We'll look at this word again. We'll figure out a good meaning for it here in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 33. The Bible says, And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the earth. Anytime your carcass is meat for a fowl, that's not a good thing. And for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. Now, the word fray, as far as a definition for the word fray, it has four different definitions or four meanings, two of which only two of those meanings are used in Scripture. In the two verses that we just read, fray means to frighten or to terrify or to alarm. And so they, the Bible says that no man will be able to fray them away. No, no man will be able to frighten them or scare them away. Now, in Zechariah, we'll look at one place in Zechariah. It's near the end of your Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 1. In Zechariah, God uses this term for diminishing of the people who have provoked his wrath. Look at Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 21. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So here in Zechariah, the word fray means to rub off or to wear off by rubbing. I guess an example of that that we could understand is that's what a deer does or a moose would do to their horns when it comes to, or their antlers, I'm sorry. Uh, antlers fall off and grow back every year. Horns are permanent unless you cut them off. And so uh, a, a deer would, would rub his head against a tree and he would fray away or rub off his antler. So the word fray means to wear off by rubbing or to frighten or to terrify depending on the context. Now come to Jude all the way to the back of your Bible, the little bitty book right before the book of Revelation. Just a small little book of Jude. And we'll look at word number 104, and that word is gainsay, G-A-I-N-S-A-Y, gainsay. So the word gainsay, gainsaying, or gainsayers is found five times in five verses in our King James Bible. Now the word means, it means to contradict. It means to oppose in words. It means to deny, to dispute, or to declare as not true, to gainsay. Now, the more vocal an individual or church becomes in declaring the truth of the gospel, declaring the word of God, the more vocal the opposition is going to be towards that. So Moses met with this type of opposition, and we'll see that. Uh, he met that type of opposition in the person of Korah. We read about it in Jude chapter 1. Of course, that took place in the Old Testament, and we'll look at that in a minute. I think it's Numbers chapter 16. But in Jude chapter 1, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Well, you know what Cain did? Cain 
slew his brother out of jealousy because God didn't accept his sacrifice, but he did Abel. So they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the Ur of Balaam for reward. And of course, Balaam encouraged or helped folks to sin. And uh, for the monetary gain, he, he, he had the idea to uh, curse God's people, but you can't curse that which is blessed. And so he came up with a scheme of causing the people or encouraging the people to fall into sin. And you certainly don't want to be involved in that kind of lifestyle. So we see the gr ran greedily after the Ur of Balaam for reward. Now look what the rest of it says. And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, in Numbers chapter 16, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and I believe 250 of the princes of, of Israel, they rose up in opposition to Moses and Aaron. And they spoke evil concerning them. And God called it gainsaying here in the book of Jude. That's what we're learning about. Now, come to Luke chapter 21. Look what Jesus has to say about this. Luke chapter 21 and verse 15. We're talking about gainsay or gainsaying. Jesus promises divine help to those who oppose you. Look what the Bible says. Aren't you glad that Jesus will be our helper? Look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 15. Jesus said, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or nor resist. And so the strategy of the, uh, or leader of the New Testament church to combat gainsaying, the way that you do that is to faithfully teach the truth. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but the Bible says in Titus 1 and verse number 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And so we need the preaching of the Bible. We need the preaching of Bible truth in order to silence the gainsayers. There's some other references as well in Acts chapter 10 and Romans chapter 10. Now come all the way back again, if you will. We're going back and forth in the Bible. Come to Exodus chapter number 30. Exodus chapter 30. I will try my best to pronounce this word correctly, and I'll give you the spelling, and you can pronounce it the way you want to, but right now I'm preaching, so ever how it comes out, that's right for the moment. Um, the word is galbanum. Galbanum, G-A-L-B-A-N-U-M, and I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Galbanum, G-A-L-B-A-N-U-M. It's found only one time in the Bible, and it's found here in Exodus chapter 30, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 34, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 34. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee three sweet spices, Stacti and Anya and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall be a, be a light weight. Now, there's three spices none of you ladies have used this week, but um, they, they are spices nonetheless. Now, clearly, this is some kind of a sweet spice. This is a thick, gummy resin which uh, extrudes from the stem of a particular flowering plant that grows much in Africa. It has an acrid, bitter taste and a strong, unpleasant smell. Now, don't you think it's strange that the Lord here in this passage of Scripture, without getting a lot of a context of what's going on here in Exodus chapter 30, I think it's strange that the Lord instructed Moses to use this galbanum in the making of a perfume to use in the tabernacle when the smell is so unpleasant to man. Well, I believe that he did this to remind us how that what God thinks is smells good and what you and I thinks is a good smell may be different, amen. And so remember what that to God the horrible death of his son was a sweet smelling savor, according to Ephesians chapter five and verse number two. And the daily death of those who are born again is a savor unto life, according to Second Corinthians chapter two and verse number sixteen. Now, come to Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, or look at the word garlands. There's a word that you recognize, especially you uh, ladies. Acts chapter 14, we'll look at the word garlands. It's only in the Bible one time, so keep the decorations to a minimum. No, I'm just kidding. Acts chapter 14, and verse number 13, we find the word Garland. Now, a garland is a wreath or a chaplet made of branches, flowers, feathers, and sometimes even precious stones. It is worn on the head, 
like a crown. Now, in Acts chapter 14, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Then the priest of Jupiter, which had become, which was before, then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. And so here, here are these, uh, in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas, they were abled, enabled by the Lord to perform a, a, a work of healing in Lystra. They had healed a, a lame man. And the people thought that because of that, Paul and Barnabas were, Barnabas were aliens from another country, and they wanted to worship them as gods that had came down from other planets. They, in fact, look what the Bible says here in verse number 14, I believe it is. It says, which one of the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of. Let me back up, back up. Back up, back up to verse number uh, 11. And when the people saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, in the speech of Laodicea, yeah, the gods are come down to us in likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of, of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. And so they wanted to offer a sacrifice and worship Paul and Barnabas as gods because of this miracle that they had performed. And they thought that they had come down from, from outer space, from some planet, and that they were a god. Now, before you think in your mind the same thing I think, man, these people are crazy. Things haven't changed a whole lot. Our government, our government is spending billions of dollars every year, every year sending rockets and space shuttles and every kind of thing to all kinds of places out of space looking for life on another planet. And so things haven't changed a whole lot. People, people are still looking for anything but God. Now, in the passage in Acts chapter 14, we understand that the sacrificing of the oxen uh, we, to these aliens, we understand that. But these garlands... He brought these garlands because they were going to make a crown out of these garlands for Paul and Barnabas. Now, don't you think about this. Paul and Barnabas went into this city here in Lystra, and they only performed one miracle. And these people thought that these heathen thought that they were gods that came down from another planet, and they were willing to worship them. And then we oftentimes sit around and wonder how the Antichrist is going to easily amass such a following and all the people are going to immediately bow down to him and worship him. And things haven't changed a whole lot. They're, they're, people are just looking for something. And so it will be very easy for the Antichrist to be followed when he comes. Now come back to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and we'll look at the word gleed. If I said it correctly, G L E D E, gleed, found only one time in the Bible. Gleed. Deuteronomy 14 and verse number 13. Deuteronomy 14, I'll, I'll begin reading verse number 10. Verse number 13 is the verse we're looking for. The Bible says, Of all clean birds ye shall eat, but these are they of which ye shall not eat. The eagle, the ostrich, the ostrich, the osprey, and the gleed, and the kite, and the vulture after his kind. So we know by reading that verse number thirteen, we can tell that it's a gleed is some kind of bird. In fact, it refers to it refers to any type of several birds of prey that are common in Europe. Now its name is similar to glide, so called, because of its swift and easy motion when in flight. This, is a, this bird likes to seize its food by violence. Sometimes this bird even steals prey from other birds when it has an opportunity to do so. Uh, when food is scarce, it will scavenge, meaning it will find and eat dead stuff. And for that reason, one of the reasons at least, I mean, there may be more, this, this bird was unclean according to the dietary laws that God gave to the nation of Israel. Now come to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. We'll look at word number 108, which is glistering. I like this word. 1 Chronicles 29. We'll look at 1 Chronicles 29 and Luke chapter 9. 1 Chronicles 29 and Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at the word glistering. G-L-I-S-T-E-R-I-N-G. The word glistering is found two times 
in two verses in our King James Bible. The first one is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 2. I'll read verse number 1 first. The Bible says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender. And the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Verse number 2 says, Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, and onyx stones for uh, and onyx, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones, and of divers colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Now, before we talk about it, look at Luke chapter nine. Let's look at Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine. Talking about the word glistering. Luke chapter nine. We see that it is glistering stone. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 29 is the verse. Let's read verse 28 first. The Bible said it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings that Peter that he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment, his raiment was white and Glistering. Now, of course, this is uh, on the Mount Transfiguration, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 17 and also in Mark chapter 14. And so the word glistering means bright. It means brilliant. It means shining or sparkling. On Mount Transfiguration, the three uh, apostles got a glimpse of Jesus Christ in his bright, brilliant, shining, sparkling splendor. Now, Luke chapter 9 gives us some additional information to help with the understanding of the word. Let's keep reading. We, we read verse 28 and 29. Look at verse number 30. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. We know that to be Moses and Elijah from the other places that's recorded in Scripture. So when Jesus' glory is revealed, it is glistering, according to Luke chapter 9. It was bright, it was brilliant, it was shining or sparkling. Now, look at Matthew. I'm going to show you a couple things here. Look at Matthew chapter 16. This, this, this glory is the same description used when Jesus returns at the second advent. Now, we're talking about the second coming, not the rapture, but when he actually comes back to this earth, Look at Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his work. When he comes back in his glory, he's going to come back glistering. He's going to be bright, brilliant, shining, sparkling. What a blessing. Now look at Matthew chapter 19. The same description, the same description, uh, is given when Jesus sits on his throne in the temple to reign as king during the millennium. And that millennium is going to be some kind of time. The Bible says in Matthew 19, verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall, shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now just imagine... A city, I'm talking about New Jerusalem now, where the street is purest gold, the Bible says, the walls are glass-like gemstones, the 12 foundations are made of precious stones. We've talked about them a little bit. We'll talk about a little bit, uh, maybe to, some more tonight if we get that far. And seated high and lifted up in that New Jerusalem is the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory. He'll be bright, brilliant, shining, and sparkling in his most deserved glory. And what a blessing that'll be. That's why, that's why John the Revelator said in Revelation chapter 22, or Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 23, and he said, The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten the city, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So no wonder the sun's not going to be needed. 
your Savior is going to be in his glory. It's going to be bright, going to be brilliant, going to be shining, going to be sparkling. He's going to outshine the sun, S-O-N, that is. So what a blessing. Amen. What a day that's going to be. Come back to Second Chronicles. We'll look at word 129. For those of you who are faint-hearted already, my goal is to make it to 125. Second Chronicles chapter 26. Two of you passed out. Three of you took a pill of some kind. Second Chronicles chapter 26. Habergon. Habergon. The word habergon or habergons, plural, is found five times in five verses in our King James Bible, the first of which is right here in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 14. The Bible says, And Uzzah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habergons and bows and slings to cast stones. So the immediate guess would be that a habergon is a piece of armor, and that's exactly what it is. It's a piece of defensive armor. Uh, descending from the neck to the middle of the body and formed of little iron rings or a linkage of iron meshes. Now, contrary to the myth that the, a warrior's armor was so heavy that he wasn't even able to mount his own horse without assistance, that is probably not the truth at all. Um, this, this armor was so well fitted that the warrior could move about easily and it is guesstimated that the weight of that armor was probably no more than 50 pounds, which is about what uh, the amount of weight that a, a soldier in today's modern army would be wearing as far as his army, uh, his armor, backpack, and all the stuff that he carries. And there's some other references to that as well in Exodus, Nehemiah, and Job. Okay, come back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we're trying to get your Bibles broke in. You have a new Bible. We're flipping from one side to the other. Trying to get everything loosened up. Acts chapter number 8, word number 110 is hailing, H-A-I-L-I-N-G. The word hail, H-A-L-E, is found one time. And the word hailing, H-A-L-I-N-G, is found one time in our King James Bible. Right here in Acts chapter 8, I'll begin reading in verse number 1. Verse number 3 is the verse. Acts chapter 8, verse number 1. The Bible says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And of course, that's Stephen's death. He was stoned to death in chapter 7. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entered into every house and hauling men and women committed them to prison now the difficult understanding of this word has to do with the way it's pronounced it is actually pronounced hauling or hauling h-a-u-l-i-n-g is the actual pronunciation of this word hailing h-a-i-l-i-n-g it is actually pronounced hauling h-a-u-l-i-n-g now, like hauling, the word hauling means to pull or draw with force or to drag. So the way it is used in Acts chapter 8, hauling men and women to prison, it has to do, implies that those Christians were taken in roundups. They were not uh, actively resisting arrest, but uh, they were certainly not cooperating that much either. It gives us the indication or the sense that they were being pulled behind infantry or mounted soldiers. They were close to being dragged off to prison. Now, come back to Deuteronomy, if you will, chapter 19. Wouldn't it be horrible to have to go to prison? Thank God for my freedom. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Verse number five. Word 111 is held, H-E-L-V-E, held. It's only found one time in our King James Bible. And we can probably get a pretty good understanding of what the definition is by its lone reference here in Deuteronomy chapter 19. We'll read verse number four. Verse five is the verse. And this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither that he may live. 
Whosoever killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hateth not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetched a stroke with the axe and cut down the tree, and the head slipped from the held and lighted upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee unto one of these cities and live. And so obviously the helve is the handle of an axe or the handle of a hatchet or chisel or hammer. Now, I thank God that I've never been hit by one of those, but I have seen people swing an axe before and the head fly off of it. I just praise the Lord. I wasn't in its path, amen. And so that's what it's talking about here, manslaughter or accidental murder. No, there was no evil intent. The previous verse, verse number four, said he didn't hate him in time past. It was a complete accident. And so there were cities of refuge is what he's talking about fleeing to. But this helv is a handle of an axe or hatchet. All right, come to Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1. And let's look at this word hires. H-I-R-E-S, hire. The word hire in all of its many different English word forms is found 59 times in 55 verses in the King James Bible. Only read Micah chapter 1 here and verse number 7. Micah chapter 1, verse number 7. The Bible says, And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it for the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Now, we know, we know that to hire means to employ, or and hire refers to the reward for services rendered. Now, strangely enough, this plural word, hires, carries a negative secondary meaning that is associated specifically to the reward for illegal or base services. In other words, if you're doing something that is illegal or something that is wrong for monetary gain, it is referred to as hires in the plural form, uh, contrary to it being a legitimate business that you are to hire. Now, this loan use of the plural word hires has to do with the price of harlotry or idolatry, meaning any and all gifts given to one in exchange for immoral purposes. Now, come back to the book of Joshua. Joshua, first book after the five books of Moses. And we'll look at the word, hmm, it's pronounced hock, but that's not how it's spelled. The word is spelled H-O-U-G-H, but it's pronounced hock. Now, the word hock is found one time, and the word hog, hock, I guess is how you would pronounce it correctly, is found three times in our King James Bible. Now, uh, if you know anything about animals at all, especially horses, you've probably heard this word before. Um, the hock is the tarsal joint on the hind leg of a four-footed animal between the knee and foot. It corresponds to the ankle joint on a man, so it bends the other way. In each of the four references, it said they hawk, hawed the horses or hawked the horses. Now, I, I, I'm... Let me just give you these. I won't read them all. Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 6. The end of the verse says, Thou shalt hog their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Look at verse number 9. He, the middle of the verse. He hog, hogged their horses. I can't even. I know it's supposed to be pronounced hog because of what I've learned. But if you look at that word, it does not look like hog at all. And 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 8. I'll just read it. David Hogged, hawked all the chariot horses. It says in 1 Chronicles chapter 18, verse number 4, David also hawked all their chariot horses, but reserved of them an hundred chariots. So in Scripture, when they hawked the horses, it means they disabled the horses by cutting the sinews of the ham to the hamstring. And so this horse would be no longer be able to be used in battle. The horses running would be severely Handicapped. I would say the horses walking would be severely handicapped. They can walk on three legs. Sadly enough, I've seen them do that, but you don't want to. 
Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. I'll tell you this, animals are tough, tough beings. I was riding horses one, one day, and my father-in-law's horse got hit by a car while he was riding. And uh, we was actually on, um, what's that church road? On Welcome Baptist Church Road, there's a really sharp curve right there when you go around there. And the car came around that curve really fast and hit my father-in-law while I was on the horse. <clears throat> and it made a hole in that horse big enough you could stick your head in it. And I'm not kidding. And that vet came out, numbed that horse, sewed that thing up. And no, that one died. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong story. That horse died. The vet came out, put a needle in its neck, and it went boom. That's humane. <laughs> the other horse got kicked by a horse right behind his front leg. It, there was a hole. I ain't, I, I'm like, how can you live with a hole that big? They sewed that thing up, and that horse kept on getting it. From there. I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know how I got off on that. You, you cut a horse's hamstring, he's probably not going to be much good for anything. And that's what that word means. He hawed, hawed those horses. They were trying to slow him down in battle or in war. All right, Proverbs chapter eight, 18. We can't be running war stories with horses. I do. I, I'm not an animal lover. I'm sorry to those of you that are. I have no ill will towards you or your animals. But I do love horses. One of these days I'm going to ride one. Proverbs 18, word number 114 is ignominy, I-G-N-O-M-I-N-Y, ignominy, and it took me a while to learn how to say that today. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse number 3, this is the only time this word is found in the Bible. I'm going to begin reading verse number 1. Verse number 3 is the verse. It says, Though desire, through desire a man having separated himself, Seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. Now, this word ignominy is a public disgrace or dishonor. It means to shame, reproach, infamy. It means the act an act of deserving, uh, and it's an act that is deserving of reproach. It's a, uh, it is a synonym of reproach, dishonor, shame, and contempt. It means to deprive of a good name, and since we live in a generation where no one seems to blush about sin, from the president to the town drunk, we need a revival of ignominy. So it has to do with shame, reproach that is deserving of reproach. It seems that anymore, anything that's wicked and immoral and abominable is praised by our peers and our government and our nation, but it's still wicked in God's eyes, isn't it? Come to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Here's a good word and a good passage of Scripture about our Savior. Hebrews chapter 6. We'll look at the word immutable. Immutable. I M M U T A B L E, immutable. Now, the word immutable is found only one time, and the word immutability is found only one time in our King James Bible. Here in Hebrews 6, in chapter number 17, the Bible says, We're in God, willing more abundantly to show unto, his, unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, here's some good information just about our grammar or English language. The, the prefix I am and I in and you in or I'm in and un all declare the negativity of a thing. And so, such as, uh, some examples of that would be impossible or inco inconclusive or unexpected. And so we're talking about the word immutable, and we know that that I am means, uh, uh, declares negative, or it actually means not. 
And the root word is mutable, which means the word mutable itself means capable of alteration, subject to change, changeable in form, in quantities, or in nature. So from the root word mutable, we get the word mutant and mutation. So the prefix I am or not, if you will, and mutable, capable of being changed. So the word immutable means the thing is not able to change. It's not capable of change. So if we read that again in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 6, 17, and 18, we learn what we already know about our God. We're in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs the promise of the immutability. It's not able to change. It's not possible that it change. Of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, two things that's not possible to change, things in which it was impossible for God to lie. So we read that again, we can un easily understand that God cannot be changed. What a blessing. Now, word 116 is implead, I E M P L E A D. The word implead is found only one time. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 38. Chapter 19 and verse 38. I was preaching revival this past week, and this lady came up to me after the first night, and she said, uh, she said, Preacher, I'm trying to write down everything you say, and, and you talk really fast. I'm thinking, I don't talk near as fast as a lot of people I know. But um, I guess if you're trying to write it down, it's pretty fast. Acts chapter 19, so you know what I did? I said, look, I said, what is your uh, email address? I'll just print it to you. You don't have to, I'll just uh, email it to you. You won't have to worry about writing it down. Uh, and, and plead, Acts chapter 19, look at verse 38. Acts chapter 19, we're looking at the word implead. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies, let them implead one another. Now, the word almost sounds gruesome, but a simple one-word definition for the word implead, uh, implead is to sue. And uh, so, again, the prefix I am, not, and plead, uh, to give a, the word plead means to give an, a defense or an excuse in court or a lawsuit or a criminal case. And so it has to do the same as a plea bargain, uh, as where a lawyer seeks to reduce the charge or verdict. So the word implead means, number one, to not plead, or number two, to stop or take away a defense in the judgment of a thing. So implead. All right, look at Luke chapter 8. You're in Luke chapter 19. Look at Luke chapter 8. We'll look at another word, word number 117. In Luke chapter 11, and the word is importunity, I-M-P-O-R-T-U-N-I-T-Y, importunity. It's only found one time. It's right here in Luke chapter 11. Jesus used the word in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 8. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Now, most folks, I'm sure at some time or another, has read the Lord's Prayer here in Luke chapter 11. It's a parable on prayer. And uh, by assuming they know the meaning, a lot of folks pass right over a great blessing that is found here. In, in this verse of scripture or in this passage of scripture uh, the word importunate means an insistent or pressing demand it means firm stubbornness in solicitation as an importunate suitor or petitioner and so it has to do with being uh, uh, persistent or consistent in asking and pleading with God now, the Bible teaches us that our prayers are effectual when they're forever. That's what the Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse number 16. Here in Luke chapter 7 is a man who, while not con, uh, commended, is held up as an example of one who persists in his request to God, and God is, is faithful to meet that need or to answer that prayer because of his uh, persistence in his request. Now, from our definition of importunity, it suggests that a prayer may be unreasonable. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us 
with groanings which cannot be uttered. Oftentimes, our prayers may not be reasonable. Many times they may not be polished. They may not be exactly the way they should be. But I'm glad that the Spirit of the Lord will take our prayers and clean those things up and, and present them to the Father. What a blessing that is. Now, um, I'm glad that the Lord is able to help us. Now, look at, look at, look at this. Look at Luke chapter uh, Look at uh, verse number 9. We're still in Luke chapter 11. Let's look at verse number 9 again. The Bible says, Jesus said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So we might not have the perfect speech. We may not have the perfect words. We might not know exactly what to say. But I'll tell you, this place and some other places in the Bible as well, I can think of one, Luke chapter 18, that passage, the Lord really looks upon some persistence in praying. I, uh, I think if you'll be, sometimes we pray about things so they don't bother us no more, or we forget about them, and I think sometimes the Lord says, well, it didn't, it didn't matter as much as he thought it did. You keep on praying about that thing, I believe the Lord looks upon that and sees the earnest of that need upon your heart, and there's a couple of instances in the Bible in prayer where persistence really paid off. And so that loved one that you've been praying for, they may not be saved yet, but don't stop praying for them. I know, I know folks who prayed for people for 20 years before they ever got saved or longer. And I know folks who prayed for other needs for a long period of time before the prayer was ever answered. Now, I know there's also been times I, I've prayed about things, and, and just to be honest, and if you'll be honest, you probably had the same experience. I forgot I prayed about them after God answered them. Now, I praise the Lord for being faithful like that. But I think there's something to be said about being persistent in your prayer life. All right, now, come to Proverbs chapter 7. We'll look at uh, word number 118, impudent. It's only found three times in the Bible. We'll look at one. I'll mention the other two. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Impudent, I-M-P-U-D-E-N-T. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 13. I want to read some before that. Let me find it. Look at, uh, let me read in verse number six. Oh. It says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went in the way of her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black of the dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the street, and lieth in wait at every corner. Verse 13 says, so she caught him. That's the, the uh, man of no understanding in verse number 7. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Now, the Bible uses that word two more times in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse number 4, the Bible says, For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. It says in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 7, it says, For all the house of Israel are impudent and stiff or hard-hearted. And so here we have again the prefix I am, which signifies not, and it's joined to the word prudent, which means ashamed or modest, and so the word impudent means not ashamed or not modest. And man, oh man, don't we, have, don't we have a lot of folks today who are not ashamed of their immodesty. In fact, I think if they wouldn't get arrested, they'd just go completely naked. And uh, what, a, what a wicked thing that is. Now, Paul reminded us in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 19, he says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, I think we ought to be ashamed of some things, and we definitely ought to have some modesty. Amen. That's free on a Wednesday night. Don't even charge you for that. Come to Proverbs or Psalm 45. Psalm 45. Indicting. I am running out of time. Psalm 45, indicting. The word indicting it's found only one time in our King James Bible. It's right here in Psalm 45 and verse number 1. It says, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. 
Indicting means to direct or to dictate, to suggest, or to prompt what is to be uttered or written. What a blessing it is, he, it is here in this Psalm 45 that David's heart was directing him to do right. I hope your heart is directing you to do right as well. David here, and he's writing, he's not directing praise towards any man, any king, any priest. He's directing his praise towards God. You and I ought to be directing our praise towards the Lord. He is indicting a good matter. Now, come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at, I like this word, incontinent. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The word incontinent is only found one time, and the word incontinency is only found one time in our King James Bible. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. This word is describing people in the last days. I should read more, but I'll just read the verse. It says, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Now, the word is used, the in, incontinency or incontinency is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. and verse number 5, and it says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontency. And so again, it has the negative prefix, I-N, meaning not, and continent or continence, meaning exercise self-restraint or moderation. And it has particularly uh, indications toward the sexual nature. And so incontinent here is describing one who is not restraining the passions or appetites, particularly in a sexual appetite, indulging in every form of lust without restraint. Now, there's a lot more we can say about that, but time will not allow today. Come to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Uh, we see the word uh, Jansev, J-A-C-I-N, T-H, Jansev. Jason, Jason, I think it's Jason. I, I remember that I forgot. Jason. Now, this word is found two times in two verses. It's in Revelation 9:17. It's also in Revelation 21:20. 20. And as you can guess, it is a precious stone. Uh, it is a brown or grayish color. Occasionally, it is red. It is often transparent, and uh, so it is like a di like a diamond, a Jason optically has the highest refraction which we mean by this is what we mean by this is that light that passes through it spreads into colors of the rainbow again it approaches the brilliance of the diamond uh, look at uh, I should have told you to stay in Timothy come back to first Timothy chapter 1 I'm hurrying now this is word 122 jangling this is the only time the word is found in the Bible first Timothy 1 6 and it's talking about vain jangling the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, 6, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Now, I, I like this. This is one of those phrases in the Bible that ranks right up there with some of the other phrases that we really like. In Acts chapter 17, it talks about certain fellows of the baser sort. And um, 1 Chronicles chapter 22 talks about exceedingly magnificent. And uh, James chapter 1 talks about superfluity of naughtiness. Here's another one of those that talks about vain jangling. Now, jangling means to sound harshly and in discord. It would have the idea of playing different musicians or different instruments and those instruments being out of tune, to sound harshly and in discord. It means to quarrel in words. It means to altercate, to bicker, or to wrangle. It's probably what a lot of you were doing right before you came into church this afternoon. I hope not. Now, someone who uses their tongue in this way is called a jangler. And when a female does it, she's called a janglerless. Janglerless. So, you want to make somebody mad tomorrow? They're flapping off. Say, hey, you janglerless, why don't you slow down? They'll be confused, and you'll probably get hurt. And maybe tomorrow everybody can be happy again. Now, so vain jangling. Now, uh, Jasper, word 123, that's uh, describing a gemstone. Uh, it is a gemstone. I'm not going to go there. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse one, uh, word number 124. Jesting. I do want to look at this. 
I know it's not nine o'clock yet. We got a few minutes. Not that we have to be done at nine, but I do try to be considerate of people's time. JD gets up at two o'clock in the morning or earlier. Word number 124 is jesting. The word jesting is found only one time in our King James Bible. And for the sake of time, I would like to read all of that. I'll just read the verse, verse number 4, Ephesians 5, verse 4. It says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Thanks. Now, this little word has been so misunderstood. Some, there, Believe it or not, there are some Christians who think it is absolutely... Um, pathetic if you have any joy in your salvation or any happiness or any desire to laugh or be happy at all whatsoever and so when those self-righteous pharisees find this verse of scripture in chapter 5 and verse number 4 they think they have found their truth proof text that you cannot be laughing or have any kind of humor whatsoever and the fault is that they assume that jesting means joking when it doesn't the fact that a jester is a joker is all the supporting evidence those folks need to point out that brother so-and-so should not be laughing all the time. Actually, this sin of jesting is far more serious, and it is certainly is more prevalent in damaging to the body of Christ than laughing or cutting up. The word jest was a deed or action story that we might call a hero tale. Now, I'm going to spare some of you some heartburn tonight and not talk about all your superheroes, which would fall really well right here, but I'll let you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I would be very leery of a jester. All right? I'll just leave that right there. So the word, the word jest in French, French means to exploit. Jesta in Latin means a history of things done. Jesta in Portuguese means a chronicle or history. Instead of jesting meaning laughing or telling something humorous, it is in fact someone who exploits people or manipulates people by the magnifying by magnifying them as heroes. Now, I, I'm just going to tell you just like this: we're getting really close to what a uh, what a large number of fundamentalists do on a daily basis I wish you know they have <laughs> I think I think there's a lot of, of men worship that should not be now I, I understand the Bible talks about those that, who rule well being worthy of, of double honor and all that I get that but there's there seems to be a lot of people in our fundamental independent premillennial blah 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 Baptist movement who will spend more time pumping up themselves and praising man than they will uplifting the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's jesting. It's being a jester. There's nothing funny about that. You're making a hero out of a man. We have a hero. He's not Superman. He's not Batman. He's not Spider-Man. He's not any of those other guys. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one worthy of your praise and your exaltation. And I have a Bible word for it. So it's up to you what you do with it. Now, no one likes the preacher. Here's word 125, and I'm, I'm going to stop with a seed, and it's the word justifying. Now, the word justify, justified, justifying, justifieth, and justifier appears 61 times in 57 verses in the Bible. To justify means to declare to be right by freeing from the penalty of guilt and sin. It further means to defend or maintain as right. It means to pronounce free from guilt. It means to pardon and to absolve. Now, let's try putting that definition. I, I know we're running out of time, but come to Acts chapter 13, if you will. This is important. This will help you. This will help you in your walk with Christ right here. And I'll be done quickly. Acts chapter 13. Now, remember the definitions for these words is to declare to be right by freeing from the penalty and guilt of sin. It means to defend or maintain his right. It means to pronounce free from guilt. It means to pardon or to absolve. Now, look at this verse. I'm going to read one verse, Acts 13, verse 39. It's a good verse to you to learn and memorize, by the way. 
The Bible says, and by him, that's by Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from a few things. Right? All things. I didn't know if anybody was reading along or not. Are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, let's look at that verse again. And by him, all that believe are justified. So think about these definitions for the word justified. All that believe are justified. That means all that believe are declared to be right by being freed from the penalty of guilt and sin. It means that they're declared to be right. Uh, it means that they have uh, to defend and maintain his right. So not only were you declared right, you're maintained and kept as right. It means to pronounce free from guilt, to pardon, or to absolve from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now listen, th this is what I said this is important. A person who knows and understands the meaning of biblical terms that are used to de define the diverse aspects of God's work in our lives will never doubt his salvation. One who truly understands the meaning of justification will glory in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and not in his own. And when he does that, he will have peace concerning his salvation. And I'll tell you, Christ is all in all, and he is all we need. Amen. Look at that, 858. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. I'm glad I'm justified. I may not look very just in the eyes of man. I want to. May, may not be as just as the, my neighbor, but in the eyes of God, I'm justified through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and my faith in what he's done for me. What a blessing. I pray you'd help us now to uh, have a desire to continue to study, learn the Bible. And these simple words have great meanings that are a lot of help to us. We sure love you. We sure thank you for loving us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming and being with us this evening. Don't forget.